I'm Mike Kowalski. I'm the coordinator of e-learning for Fairfax County Public Schools. Hi, I'm Isora Everson. I'm the director of online learning for Alexandria City Public Schools and the TC Williams Satellite Campus Principal. Hello, I'm Michael Shea. I'm the producer of In Conversation and I'm a former learner in Community College student. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lerner. I'm the Associate Vice President for e-learning at Northern Virginia Community College. Welcome to the Extended Learning Institute. Please join us in conversation. Uh, in Fairfax County, we've been doing online learning for 17 years. Uh, the scale, we deal with about 4,000 students a year uh, taking online courses. Uh, roughly about 12% of our student body, our high school students, take an online course before they graduate. So uh, it's pretty robust. You know, Fairfax County, 188,000 students. It's huge. So, uh, but we're, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we're a little different than most online learning. In most online learning, uh, it's strictly asynchronous. Uh, but for Fairfax County, uh, we believe in 80% asynchronous instruction and 20% synchronous. So 20% of the time, they are with their teachers in a virtual classroom. So, uh, uh, Currently, uh, the trend in online learning uh, is moving towards a blended environment. Uh, using online learning resources in a classroom or partially in the classroom and partially at home so and jennifer you want to us about that sure yeah. so we're actually celebrating our 40th anniversary this year of distance learning at northern virginia community college so that's pretty exciting uh, of course it was not online 40 years ago but we've gone through all the different <laughs> phases and technologies from postal mail uh, to fully online at this point so that's exciting uh, about 23,000 students a year take an online course at nova so serving a very large population. And last year, I believe about 43% of NOVA students took at least one online course. Yeah. So what we're seeing is that online is becoming really a centerpiece uh, of everyone's educational trajectory. Even if they're not a fully online student, they're mixing and matching blended courses, online courses, and face-to-face -face courses according to their schedule, according to their subject matter preferences, You know, something they find more challenging, maybe they choose in, in person so that they get more face-to-face -face attention nonstop and then something they're more comfortable with they choose online and sometimes they make the opposite choice for the wrong reasons and <laughs> and struggle a little bit but um, we're definitely seeing it becoming more and more common for college students to fit online courses into their overall college picture right because that sort of makes it if you're gonna take three or four classes if one of them is online that becomes sort of your wild card in terms of your time uh, particularly yeah. with parking and traffic in northern Virginia right. Being able to have a little bit more of a flexible schedule makes a huge difference. I remember uh, when I was undergraduate, you know, there was always a question of, oh, the really good class, it's only on for eight in the morning. Mm -hmm. And you take it because you <laughs> want to take the really good class, but if that could have been online. Yeah. I went to college a long time ago. So we have a much, much smaller enrollment, of course. Um, we had 686 students mm -hmm. uh, last year take an online course. That's still a significant percentage of our enrollment overall. Uh, but we are obviously a smaller division. Uh, we started our online learning program in 2007, mm -hmm. so we're we're coming up to our 10-year anniversary, and it has gone through some some changes over the years as well. Um, but we do have even elementary students now partaking, uh, very very few, but it, there is a, a small number of them, and we have middle school students as well, and predominantly uh, the majority is high school students taking the online courses. And it's still mostly self-selected in terms of so the people that yes. do it are going to be engaged to kind of understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, with the changing legislation in Virginia, right. then we, we have, um, with the graduation requirements now including an online course, um, we are seeing changes in terms of the population uh, versus those who had traditionally taken an online course mm -hmm. and those who are taking one to fulfill a requirement for graduation. So let's talk a little about this, the, the blended idea, because that's something I think that, personally, also, I agree. It, as you were saying earlier, Mike, it, it seems like that's a very effective tool, um, and particularly for people that have never taken a class before yes. that's online. It's a great mm -hmm. transition. Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing our research show that that adult learners want blended more than anything else. Most of them don't actually want a fully online course. They want to have that experience of being in the classroom, but they also don't want necessarily the hassle and the time commitment of being in the classroom all the time. So the blended solution really is ideal for a lot of people. You're right, it gives you the experience of that 
online piece and understanding how the online technologies work, um, but also lets you flex your time. And so we're really trying to work with faculty to understand how to make the right choices about what to put in the online piece of the class right. and what to do in person, because it's a really a different set of choices from designing an online class or from designing a face-to-face -face class. You really have to think carefully about what belongs in the classroom part and making that as rich and interactive as possible and not spending time lecturing or doing any of those other things that really should and can be delivered with the technologies. But that's a little bit of a shift for a lot of teachers and faculty, so that's are really our focus in getting people prepared for that kind of delivery. And some of the sciences, is, it would be an obvious one, the lab part yes. is in the lab and then everything else can go online, yes. but with other subjects it might not be that easy to make that divide. Yes, if you're teaching literature or something like that, how do you, how do you make that choice? We have, uh, this is our fourth year of our satellite campus, and that is an entirely a blended learning environment. Mm -hmm. So it's been really, really interesting in terms of how, so the courses are online. Uh, the instruction is supplemented by our on-site teachers, who are the core area teachers, and we have an, an electives mentor teacher. And so they work very closely with the students to uh, supplement their lesson, enhance their lessons that are online with classroom instruction. So we have blended learning sessions every day at the satellite campus. And it's really, it, the students really do enjoy that, that aspect because they, they have the hands-on, right. they have the one-on-one, -on -one, they have the small group, and then they have the, the, the bulk of the instruction is online. So right. it's, no, that's it's wonderful. Time. The technology is a wonderful thing for delivering instruction. It's wonderful, but to engage and really conceptually understand it, to get that understanding, the deep understanding, you need conversations, you need a process, you need projects to do, and you need to have that involvement with the teacher, or at least with other students. And so uh, online can give you some of that, but it, oftentimes we find that uh, that's probably where the limitation lies. And so in Fairfax County, uh, as we addressed earlier, I, our our courses are 20% synchronous. In other words, students actually go to a virtual classroom. It's not face-to-face, -face, but right. it's live. And there's a teacher in there, and we use uh, in our virtual classroom. We do breakout rooms, and students can get into groups and actually discuss things. And we use that time for that higher order learning to apply the information they've learned, let the technology actually deliver instruction. Uh, and in that time, we're actually working on those higher order thinking skills and conceptual understanding. And kids these days, Maybe not all, but even if they're in the same room, they might still prefer to talk to each other through a device. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's just the mm -hmm. way this, mm -hmm. this upcoming generation is becoming. At least text each other. Right, they're texting <laughs> each other. So, so even if they're sitting across from a table, they might, they might want to have some technology in their hands in order to talk. It's a little sad. I think the nice thing about the blended <laughs> is that it really helps prepare students also for the workplace because yes. 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 you're going to need in most workplaces now to be able to function remotely with mm -hmm. staff in other places to use technologies to communicate to have online meetings yep. to do all those mm -hmm. kind of things but you also need to be able to sit down at a table with someone and negotiate something or have those face-to-face -face interactions with clients or what have you so the blended environment gives them both of those experiences and the other two types have have benefits in both ways but um, I think the blended really prepares them for the workplace the best and it's not just in the workplace you have to operate remotely but Workplaces are changing so that there's more continuous learning throughout mm -hmm. your career. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just you have to keep up with new technologies, but I think that that approach is there now and people mm -hmm. need to embrace it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I thought you made a really good point about so many college students wanting to take online courses because mm -hmm. that's, of course, what we're hoping to prepare them for mm -hmm. at the high school level is yeah. to then be able to take those courses in college. Absolutely. I mean, when the students come to us having Having come from one of your online programs it is so evident <laughs> so that they know what they're doing yeah. as opposed to a student who's never taken anything online before and they're just bewildered even the idea of just logging in mm -hmm. on the first day and knowing to get started and understanding yeah. <laughs> that there's a schedule and that it's not a self-paced experience where they can show up 15 weeks in and whenever they feel like it uh, yeah. makes a right. huge difference mm -hmm. right yeah, I think my son, uh, he, he took an online course, mm -hmm. uh, but when he went to school, I mean, all his professors used, they used Blackboard for the university he went to, uh, and a lot of them did supplemental mm -hmm. through Blackboard, and it was amazing because for him, it was a no-brainer, he could get through it, through it, no problem, but for so many of his classmates who never took a virtual class that freshman year, they struggled through, mm -hmm. yeah. well, how do I do this, how do I go here, what do I do? And so it's very interesting, and the online course actually prepares you for at least the digital environment that you're going to see at the, at the collegiate level. Well, and then continuing on, yeah. like, you, like you said. Yeah. yeah, I mean, being able to access a MOOC or, or whatever as a professional to mm -hmm. advance your career, right. and yeah, it's definitely a skill set that everybody's going to need. 
And so, I, I guess, to, for the most part, reception or reaction from a lot of the students and maybe their families is positive. Mm -hmm. But do you ever do you ever encounter like people that have maybe don't under they need more they need more information before they'll sign up for the online class? Is that ever a, an issue in any of your institutions? Always. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, the parents want to know is this the right environment for their child, mm -hmm. right. and so. Uh, we constantly get parents who want to know more about the class and is, is this right and is this a good fit for them. Uh, n not to even say the technology issues and whether you have a Mac mm -hmm. or a Windows and, right. and then is all the technology that we're using uh, going to work on their devices and stuff like that. So, okay. Okay. yeah, so it's, and then not only does it work on their devices, but can their students actually manage the technology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is another right. issue. Well, and what supports are in place that are going to help their students to right. be successful. So how, what steps are we going to take on our end to, to try right. to ensure that their student succeeds? Right. Absolutely. And in some cases, at the high school in particular, I think the students are maybe more prepared than the parents realize. Mm -hmm. I think that probably happens sometimes because I know with our, with our centers in high school, there are certain parts of technology where, I mean, I think I know what I'm doing, but <laughs> you know, he knows all these little tricks. and, and so. At some point, as a parent, you have to realize, I think, your high school student or your college student is, in many cases, is pretty, pretty good with the technology. Well, yeah. they're the natives, the digital natives, yeah. yeah. I think the technology is not usually as much of a challenge as this self-management. Yes. So to right. be really Absolutely successful in an is. online course, you know, you're not there with your teacher every day right. with them in your face, right. noticing when you're confused, reminding right. you to do things. Telling you what the you, homework If is. you don't log into Blackboard, you don't see their reminders or yeah. your email or whatever. So you have to be a little bit able to manage yourself and willing right. to fully commit yeah. to the responsibility of an online course. And that's, I think, a lot more challenging for a lot yeah, of young people than... The technology. Yeah, what, what I tell parents is at a school, we, if your son's wandering the hall, we can grab him and take him to his teacher and sit him down in the chair. <laughs> in, in the virtual world, we can't get him to log on to the system. You know, so it's it's it's, it's there, there's definitely that self motivation that has to be there to to do an online course. We also get questions about content and people mm -hmm. not certain that in, taking an online course is going to be as rigorous content wise as the face to face course and. Um, I always try to remind people, you probably, if you think back to your schooling, had great classes where you learned a lot and classes mm -hmm. where you didn't learn as much, mm -hmm. and online courses are the same. Some of them are fantastic, other ones are not as good as they should be, because that's just the nature of education. Uh, but our content definitions, the description of each course and what material is to be covered and what you're expected to learn is the same. And often students find that the online course actually, they learn a little bit more, at least at the college level. I'm not sure if this is true at the high school level or not. but if you think about a college class, often you're sitting in the back mm -hmm. and listening right. to a lecture and maybe five students participate in the discussion and everyone else kind of hides and looks at their phone or whatever. <laughs> um, and you can kind of get away with that in many <laughs> college classes traditionally. Can't get away with that in an online right. course. Right. Everyone right. has right. to be in the discussion. Everyone has yes. to submit the blog post that week. So you're actually forced to engage the material more right. and often learn more in an online environment. And it's those same five students the whole semester. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the whole year. Right. But I've had tons of parents and students tell me that, wow, these courses are actually, this is, this is a tough class. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is, absolutely. We're trying to make sure that it does match the face-to-face the -face environment and mm -hmm. that you are working hard and you're being challenged and you're motivated. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit more of a scope for differentiating the, the experience of the students mm -hmm. in the online environment. Mm -hmm. yes. It's easier to have that option of mm -hmm. here's 10 resources find the one that works best for you. Mm -hmm. That's harder to do in a lecture hall. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. But there's a huge element of choice also. So mm -hmm. you, you need to demonstrate your mastery of knowledge, but you have choice on how you do it. Because what, what technology tool you might use can vary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I did open our satellite uh, school at a new location over the summer. You know, just a free new day. and They're, they're all full and busy. Mm -hmm. But so we're at central office now, and we're based there with the students. and. Uh, it's a really beautiful campus. We're enjoying it. What motivated you to, the system to come up with the satellite campus? Was it a? Was it, it was a desire to give students a non-traditional okay. high school experience. So the flexible environment. Maybe you're a student who works outside the home. Right. Maybe you're a student who has childcare. Maybe you're a student who wants to graduate early, or right. you're a competitive athlete. So the traditional school hours from 8:30 uh -huh. to 3:30 don't work for you. Right. This is an option. You can come in the morning and go to work in the afternoon. Right. Or vice versa. Because I remember back in the 70s, which is, uh, or the 80s, I guess, is when I did a little bit of substitute teaching in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And there were alternate school programs were just wings of the school. 
-hmm. and it was really just it wasn't it wasn't really a different approach to education it was really just a different a different like, students <laughs> and different mm -hmm. teachers who maybe had better skills at dealing mm -hmm. with kids who were having trouble getting right. through with it so but this is a much more exciting thing because it's, it's yeah actual students apply to get in to yeah they all the courses are online with the blended learning, and, and it's going to a completely different location. So that's right. I think one thing interesting in Virginia, uh, there was a bill that was passed last year that dealt with uh, developing a Virginia virtual school, which would allow full time K twelve enrollment. So if a parent in Northern Virginia or Prince William County or Alexandria wanted to go strictly to full time online. Uh, this solution that the state is looking to come up with uh, will do so. Uh, that bill passed; everything went through, but it's up. It has to, it has to pass another legislative period, and if it does, uh, we'll see full time online in Virginia probably in 2017-18. So that'll be interesting and for our programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, my program is supplemental. You know, I get, most of my kids take one or two courses. Uh, very rarely do I get a student that takes all their courses online. Uh, we find that, in, at least in Fairfax County, we, we like the services of the school. My program mm -hmm. delivers instruction. My teachers are great. Uh, the issue is I don't have, I don't have any uh, school counseling resources, mm -hmm. facility resources, busing, transportation, health, you know, the, the whole nursing issue, and of course food. So, you know, of course, that, if you're staying at home taking classes, you just hit the refrigerator, but, yeah, <laughs> or, but, you know, we don't have all those resources, and so uh, we rely on the school to provide us in Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. I do fear how much our son would hit the refrigerator. For <laughs> he already, when he, even though he's at school every day, he manages to do a lot of damage in the refrigerator. Well, and there's the kids that will be able to come to school and do like our satellite campus mm -hmm. and yeah. work for four hours in the morning and then go to their jobs and that structure works for them. And then I have students who prefer to work between 2 to 4 a.m. Those are the prime right. hours like when we when we track their, their progress. Tons of our students, mm -hmm. 2 to 4. They should be waiting for college. A.m. That, I think. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have that, do you have track that or do you uh, at the college we, level do you we see We don't worry about that too much but we yeah. certainly do see those nighttime workers and we actually offer 24-7 help desk so that students can call us at 2 a.m. and get some help if they're having trouble submitting something or you know because what you don't want is them being at 2 a.m. panicking right. and right. getting stressed <laughs> and we can't help them with everything at 2 a.m. you know we don't have the whole staff right. here obviously but at least someone they can reach and we can even they can even just leave a note for the daytime staff or for the faculty member that says so and so called at 2 a.m. here's what the problem was here they're very upset so that we can get back to them right away in the morning um, they're probably still asleep at that point but at least they know they told someone Right, and then so they feel a little better. This sounds like the State Farm commercial where like, who, yes. who are you talking to at three in the morning? <laughs> uh, but no, that I, I did not realize that. That's kind of impressive. Uh, we also have twenty four seven librarian help actually. So if they're they can, it's a partnership uh, nationwide. So the California librarians work the evening hours, and then uh, they take turns with the nighttime uh -huh. hours. But so that way, they're doing a research paper at two a.m. They've got to turn it in by six a.m. or whatever their deadline is. <laughs> Someone's still there to help them with that database or find just that right resource they needed to finish things up. Right, because that's the important part of this. If you step away from a traditional school environment, you don't, you're not in the lot. You're not walking down the hall to the library anymore. Right. Do you, do you address that in the high school programs? Do you have librarian support available to them? or We don't have librarian support available to them. Yeah. Uh, we do have library services support, in other words. Oh, okay. We have databases and research area. You know, those yeah. things are available to them. Uh, no, we don't, Likewise, we don't provide no. a librarian. We do have mentors. So okay. every one of my online students has an online mentor who works in conjunction with the student and the online teacher as another and then layer of safety in terms of reminders and encouragement mm -hmm. and coaching and you can do it. Yeah. We do a similar kind of thing with that. We call them student success coaches nice. and that's nice. exactly their role. Now since we have 23,000 students and five coaches, we don't have that one-on-one -on -one relationship, <laughs> but uh, we do you know, try to personalize it as much as possible and quite frankly, not all students need or are going right. to be willing right. yes. to have that one-on-one. -on -one. Right. So we contact them 
and we and especially at the college we can't force them to do anything like that so we we simply reach out and we personalize the communications and we track it and those who want that one-on-one -on -one relationship we develop it with them and, and mm -hmm. cheer them on and help yeah. make sure they know the resources here's how you get to the tutoring did you know you could have called at 2 a.m. and we had someone <laughs> to talk to you and here's how you reach the librarian and all those kind of things but sometimes even just getting an email or a text something from somebody once a week can make mm -hmm. a big difference. Absolutely, they're so function. grateful. Oh, thank you for checking in with me. I, you know, they just don't necessarily always know there's someone there. I think it's different for you because you have the synchronous mm -hmm. piece, but if it's asynchronous, they yeah. sort of imagine the whole class as being run by computers and robots and don't realize right. we they have this whole set of people human, here to talk to them. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to just quickly explain synchronous and asynchronous? Oh, sure. Just, just Do, would you like to, since you were? Yeah. <laughs> synchronous means that the teacher is there at the same time as the student. And okay. so, uh, for us, we use a we use a basically a WebEx type product. Uh, if you want okay. to think of that, so this, uh, a teacher has 25 students. They'll meet with their teacher online once a week right. for an hour, uh, and you know at that time they have the ability to do those type of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what's going on? I'm not seeing your work turned in stuff like that. They can do that at the end. You know, there's after class. <laughs> like Johnny stay after class, and, like, oh, <laughs> and of course, they, and the nice thing about our virtual classrooms is we record it. So if mm -hmm. someone ever misses it, someone can watch it. Of course, all those personal things are done after the recording is turned off. So do do, do, do right, students right. ever pretend that their internet is down or something? Like, oh no, I didn't hear that question. Or, uh, uh, my mic. <laughs> but is, you're not in the room. You well, see, because we require mics so they can actually speak in dialogue. And so okay. the issue is, yeah, my mic's not working. You know, so they, I'll get your mic working. <laughs> uh, I guess what's the future? What's like the next the next thing for you all? What do you think? Like what's, what's I think at the at the college level, we're yeah, looking yeah. to move towards competency based education. Right. So uh, what that means is instead of having a seat time based definition where you get credit for your degree based on how many classes you sit through and pass. Competency-based education says, here are the 300 different things you need to know and be able to do and be able to perform to earn this degree or credential. And then we're gonna set up learning opportunities for you that you can put together in an individualized way and do as slowly or as quickly as you need to for your learning needs. And then you get the degree when you've shown you've mastered all those. Mm -hmm. So some students will be able to go through quickly and they didn't need to sit through 16 weeks of stats because they can get through stats themselves in four weeks just self-teaching. Other students years. need four years, exactly. So it's just a much more flexible and personalized and especially for adult learners, um, not even talking about the traditional age college student, but someone who's 25, 35 coming back to mm -hmm. college and trying to better their family right. by getting a credential, this is the way to go and it's yeah, very appealing. Absolutely. Uh, we have to figure out how we work in interaction with other students. When you're working on this self-paced type of environment, how do you make sure that people are also working on group projects and all the other things that build your skills for the workplace and right. the other things that you're going to need. But I think that we have a lot of opportunities in that area and we're just starting to get our feet wet. But there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in that area. And I think just getting the word out that that's, those are options would be mm -hmm. would really, because a lot of people have the idea that I'm going to have to sit through 16 weeks of stats or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, that immediately turns mm -hmm. off. Or you reach a certain point, now I'm at that age, where you want maybe you want a credential, you want to study, but you mm -hmm. don't want to, you know, commit to right. four years of study. Mm -hmm. So that's that's terrific. Yeah. Well I was gonna say yeah, prescriptive the prescriptive method that mm -hmm. that's what they call prescriptive instruction where you can demonstrate that you know when you demonstrate you know things, you don't have to be delivered that instruction again. Right. And so, you know, if, if you know 12 weeks of stats, and it's really only about four weeks of stats you don't know, you have the ability to move through the okay. curriculum fairly quickly and right. still finish and still show that you're competent or that you have mastery of that material. Right. So that's, that, that's big. And that, but that's hard because going through, you know, state boards of education mm -hmm. and seat time mm -hmm. and of course the NCAA yeah. yep. their yeah. requirement you mm -hmm. can't do it that way you for the can. NCAA no. you, can't, you can't you can't do a prescriptive solution uh, which is good because they had some people violate that mm -hmm. online people yeah. violate that so they've actually pulled the reins in on with the NCAA clearinghouse so it's uh it, you know it it, it it will take some time I think for society to actually come up with a solution that's going to work best mm -hmm. and also meet those you know what, what are those job embedded needs that you right. need beyond right. just learning material, mm -hmm. working with people, knowing the technology, um, 
you know, being able to come up with solutions in collaborative fashion, you know, those are all very important in the workplace. So. And using the technology to sort of allow someone to self-diagnose what they need mm -hmm. is probably an important mm -hmm. tool too. Absolutely. Because, you know, you might not, you might think you need stats and then you realize, oh no, wait, I know most of this. Mm -hmm. Watch a couple of videos and you're back in the game. <laughs> All right, I'm saddened that we, we keep using stats as an example <laughs> because it's truly tragic. <laughs> <laughs> Macroeconomics. <laughs> oh, even better. <laughs> that was uh, my graduate degree in economics. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. oh, I'm doing stats right now in grad school. Anyhow, um, we're looking <laughs> down the road to uh, try to, to grow our program. Okay. Um, so we're eight years in. And um, we're going to continue with our student supports because um, that has been very well praised by the students in right. terms of the, the structures helping them to succeed and um, continuing to grow the program to fulfill the, the state requirements regarding mm -hmm. online courses. Uh, we have a wide selection of offerings um, for a small division. We've, we've got a lot on our plate in yeah, terms of yeah. what the students can take. They have Mandarin Chinese available, Latin three, art history, right. game design. So they have a wide variety of options, which does help with the student interest. And so right. we want to keep keep motivating the students to participate. Right. And do you for are you projecting a growth in the satellite campus? We are you expecting? We would, we would like to yeah. absolutely. Okay. Looking down the road, yes, we could accommodate up to a hundred students. Okay. So yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, I would hope. Uh, Back 17 years ago when I started this, uh, one of the things that I used to say was I hope to, we get to the point where online instruction, the, you know, the technology that can deliver learning objects, if we can actually make that uh, ubiquitous across all teachers in all mm -hmm. environments. Right. And if we can do that, and if teachers have that ability, then we can get rid of my program because you could have <laughs> a teacher at a school with 140 students the reality is they have 130 at school and 10 are actually home for whatever reasons they are. We, oh, yeah. we have a whole system yeah. of homebound instruction in, yeah. in the state of mm -hmm. Virginia for all those kids who need it. And that was the primary focus when we started. We had about 5,000 students in, in homebound or alternative environments in mm -hmm. Fairfax County. So 17 years ago we were looking for a solution to deliver high quality instruction to them where they're at. And so we've done that. We feel really good in Fairfax County that we've done that. But hopefully what will happen is that will evolve into that we just have learning objects that mm -hmm. teachers can use. And if, you know, if you're with me in the class, we're going to do these activities mm -hmm. and stuff like this. But if you're home, I'm going to send you this lesson, a right. virtual lesson, okay. and you do this virtual lesson. It basically, the, the companies are the same and everything is the same, mm -hmm. but you can do this and the people in the classroom can do this. We'll do that. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get there. Well, I'm, I commend you for being willing to make your goal be that you get your job goes away. <laughs> but what's your, but my your job goal goes is, away. My job goes away before that goal ever sits. <laughs> but the other the other risk here is I think that might eliminate snow days, that which are a treasured part of childhood. They are a treasured part of childhood. That's true. I think it was maybe three four years ago we had a long snow day right. where it was you know we were out two three days and it right. was against yeah. a weekend so there was a, a significant chunk of class missed and when you're talking about an eight-week class that That's you miss a lot. a lot so we actually did a survey of our faculty after that to see how many of you took advantage of the technologies to keep pushing information to your students and giving them activities to do so you didn't lose all that time and actually about 60 percent did so we're st we still have a ways to go in terms of making sure all the faculty have those skills, particularly our adjunct faculty. So our full-time mm -hmm. faculty are much easier to train because they're here mm -hmm. and this is their full-time job. So it's, it's understood as a requirement. If you're an adjunct faculty member, you have a full-time job during the day and you come here and teach a night class for us, we love those faculty because they have all this industry expertise they're bringing to right. their teaching, but it's difficult for them to find time to come to training, understandably. Well, I because think I, all of our institutions are pretty forward-thinking and that's what that's realize that this, this is where it's going. <laughs> where it's and going. so to, and even if financial yeah. times are tough, to, to stop doing this to would just be shooting yourself yeah. in the foot. Mm -hmm.